Welcome back to Combat Mission Cold War, where we're going to take a look at Soviet BTR-60 and 70 variants. Where they came from, what they're for, their basic characteristics in Combat Mission, and where they fit into Soviet Cold War doctrine. BTR is the Russian acronym for Armoured Transporter, or essentially Armoured Personnel Carrier. Soviet doctrine had an emphasis on speed and depth, so finding a way for infantry to keep pace with tanks was always a concern. Famously in World War II, this involved heavy use of tank riders, getting the infantry to literally catch a ride with the armour they were supporting, and considerably less famously, on increasing numbers of half-tracks supplied by the United States. This requirement didn't go away after the war, and the Soviets developed the BTR-152, which in blunt terms, is what you get when you try and combine the bodies of the American M3 and German 251 half tracks and bolt the results onto a commercial truck. This isn't to say that the BTR 152 wasn't a good enough design, but the Soviets could certainly see a lot of improvements when they set out to replace it. The main areas here included ensuring an amphibious capability, decreasing the ground pressure, and adding a roof to provide both some protection from above and against MBC threats. It also needed to be cheap and easily produced en masse because the Soviet army had taken the decision in the late 50s to convert all of its infantry divisions into motor rifle divisions and they all needed transport. The design bureaus of Zil and Gaz were provided with the requirements and the design from Gaz won out, with the new vehicle entering service in 1960, designated the BTR-60P. This didn't actually include the roof the army wanted, so a development rectifying this designated the BTR-60PA began production only three years later. By 1966, the PA variant was replaced by the PB variant replacing the pintle-mounted heavy machine gun with the enclosed one-man turret from the BRDM scout car, slightly thicker armour and more hatches for the passengers. This variant was produced in vast numbers until 1976, when it was superseded by a modernised design designated the BTR-70. This incorporated some more key improvements, again improving the armour and hatches, and introducing puncture-resistant tyres, but failed to overcome two of the BTR's main issues. Despite several attempts, entry and exit were still awkward and time-consuming, and the twin-engine design was not only higher in maintenance than a single-engined one, but presented a significant fire risk. As a result, the BTR-70 saw limited production and was replaced fairly quickly in 1984 by the BTR-80, which took greater steps towards solving these problems. That's as far as we're going in this video though, the BTR-60PB was the dominant variant in the Cold War period, with 25,000 vehicles produced. Despite not seeing combat in its envisaged European theatre, the BTR has seen extensive service across the world, from the Middle East to Vietnam, from Ukraine to Afghanistan, and even from Africa to Grenada. The three main variants in Combat Mission Cold War are the BTR-60PA, the BTR-60PB, and the BTR-70. These are all close enough in their basic characteristics to be taken together here. Starting off with mobility, driving as fast as possible in a straight line. In one turn, the BTR can do about 880 meters on a paved road, about 650 meters on a dirt track, and about 470 on grass. As usual, this is more an exercise in providing a general impression of the vehicle's speed, because fighting in these exact conditions is pretty unlikely. For reference, off-road on grass, this means that the BTR is slightly faster than the T-62 and the Shilka, but somewhat slower than the BMP and more advanced tanks like the T-64. Something to bear in mind, because the Soviets really emphasised those combined arms formations. The BTR is amphibious, propelled by a water jet system, though obviously crossing water obstacles is a lot slower than travelling on land, and finding suitable entry and exit points is the hard part. There really isn't much to say here, somewhat ironically, as we're going to see later, but the BTR stands out from the crowd of other armoured personnel carriers in Combat Mission Cold War because it's wheeled instead of tracked. This has advantages, but those advantages don't necessarily apply at the relatively small tactical scale of combat mission. The firepower is a little more relevant. The BTR-60PA is armed with a Dushka 12.7mm heavy machine gun on a centrally located pintle mount just behind the cab, with the gunner operating it from an open hatch. 
this is clearly not great. The gunner is exposed, the open hatch compromises the vehicle's NVC protection, and the traverse is very limited, but the Dusha can engage targets out to about 960 meters, at which range it has the punch to inflict spalling hits on the side armor of M113s. It's not going to get to the upper front plate, even at 200 meters though, so along with the other issues, it's not too surprising that the BTR-60PB saw an upgrade. This replaces the Pintel Dushka with a 14.5mm KPVT heavy machine gun plus a coaxial PKT in a one-man turret. The KPVT is a lot more capable than the Dushka and will produce partial penetrations on the M113's front slope all the way out to 1000 meters and go straight through the side armor at the same range. The turret also obviously offers a degree of protection to the gunner, though naturally visibility is restricted compared to the completely open position of the BTR-60PA. The BTR-70 uses the same turret as the BTR-60PB and all three variants carry 500 rounds of armor-piercing incendiary ammunition for the heavy machine gun, with the two later variants carrying 1500 rounds for the coax. This is the PKT machine gun, which is pretty standard on Soviet armored vehicles. Effective against infantry and light targets, it can range out to about a thousand meters, but good luck actually spotting infantry targets at that distance. Finally, rounding out the firepower, all the standard BTRs are equipped with firing ports for their passengers. This is part and parcel of Soviet doctrine. Speed is critical, and it takes a long time to dismount infantry, let them do infantry things, and then get them back in their vehicles. So Soviet doctrine emphasizes fighting from inside vehicles if possible to maintain momentum. How effective it would actually be to try and engage enemy infantry from inside a moving BTR is questionable. Spotting and aiming is difficult, though suppressive area fire is entirely possible. On the other side of the coin, the BTR's protection is pretty lacklustre. Although the angled hull increases effective armour thickness, a byproduct of the vehicle's amphibious characteristics, and each new variant increases the amount of armour protection, the BTRs are still going to suffer spalling or even partial penetrations to the side armour from NATO 7.62mm small arms fire inside 500 meters. The frontal armour is more effective, but will still suffer spalling from 50 caliber fire at 1000 meters. Everything else, from light anti-tank weapons to tank cannon, will do terrible things to BTRs. On the survivability side, the double engine power plant requires two fuel tanks, which increases the chance of fire, so they are pretty susceptible to outright combusting when they get hit. This is bad news for anyone inside, because getting out of the vehicle is an ergonomic nightmare. The BTRs can carry nine passengers, but these enter and exit via small hatches in the roof. Even with the BTR-70, which incorporates a small side hatch on either side of the hull, it takes about 12 to 15 seconds for a full squad to dismount, and there is no protection from incoming fire. This is partly due to the BTR's interior layout. Most APCs and IFVs have the passengers at the rear and facilitate exit via large doors or ramps, but the BTR has the power plant at the rear and the passengers in the middle where, owing to the wheels, opportunities for installing exit points are limited. Inside the BTR, there are eight spaces for passengers sitting back to back on central benches with another seat for the squad leader in the right of the cab. This is the commander's position, which is provided with a series of periscopes so we can see what's going on. Off to his left is the driver, while the gunner operates the BTR's weapons from a seat immediately behind them. The BTR also carries extra small arms ammunition, including five PG-7BL RPG rounds, and mounts a radio. Telling the basic variants apart is very simple. The BTR-60PA is the one without a turret, the BTR-60PB has an engine grille on the rear roof, and the BTR-70 has three very distinct engine hatches instead, with what I always assumed were radiators on top. Plus, in vanilla Combat Mission Cold War, the model is a different shade of green. How important it is to actually tell them apart in a Combat Mission context is somewhat questionable. The other variants are also pretty simple once you get your head around the alphabet soup. Command variants have a K on the end, so the BTR-60PBK is the command variant of the BTR-60PB. These aren't visually different in-game, but they come with a third crewman to occupy the commander's seat permanently, no extra ammunition, and they have better radios. 
Finally, there is the BTR-60PU, which is specifically a command vehicle for air defence units. This is immediately recognisable by the lack of a turret and the telescopic antenna behind the commander's hatch. It has a crew of four and should really be staying out of the way, directing the air defence battle instead of getting into trouble. So, it should be pretty clear by now that the BTR platform in Combat Mission Cold War is not a massively inspiring piece of kit. It's a lightly armed, lightly armoured, funny shaped swimming box on wheels. It is in fact exactly what it says on the tin, an armoured transporter. How to use BTRs in combat mission is where things get interesting. On the one hand, looking at this from a purely technical gameplay perspective, the BTR falls into the same kind of box as World War II half tracks. It's a machine to get infantry from point A to point B. It's only really armed for self-defense or suppression of enemy infantry targets, and it needs to operate with minimal exposure because it's incapable of taking a hit. In other words, BTRs need to remain out of sight and out of trouble until enemy tanks and anti-tank weapons have been destroyed or suppressed. After the battlefield, or a section of the battlefield, is clear of threats, the BTRs can advance safely to either exit for a breakthrough objective or deploy their infantry to clear and occupy enemy strong points or dense terrain. However, Soviet Cold War doctrine is approaching from a different angle. At combat missions level, the Soviets are much more interested in forcing a decision one way or the other to feed into the overarching operational level. The Cold War battlefield overshadowed by the threat of tactical nuclear weapons, is expected to be a low density environment occupied by mobile forces, with battles developing as these mobile forces collide. The Soviet concept emphasises the march, with units continually moving forward on different axes to overwhelm the enemy, break through and exploit at speed into the enemy rear areas, hopefully precipitating collapse. If resistance is encountered, it is either fixed and bypassed or overcome by rapidly accumulating combat power derived from the organisation, composition and spacing of units on the march. This combat power does not only include increasing numbers of motor rifle infantry and BTRs, but more and more tanks and more and more artillery, with the distances between sections of the advancing force being calculated to give commanders the time to appreciate the situation, develop a plan and integrate an effective fire plan. By the time a Soviet battalion sized force arrives on the battlefield, not only should a considerable amount of preparation have already taken place, but because the Soviet army is a battle drill army, it simply deploys from company columns to platoon columns to lines and conducts an attack with the whole combined arms show of tanks, artillery and infantry pre-built in. The aim is to get more firepower and more mass to the anticipated meeting engagements than the enemy can, and to do so faster than the enemy can. So what the Soviet army needs from the BTR is operational mobility, to enable the speed and tempo, and the simplicity and low cost to equip a vast conscript army. The BTR's combat characteristics that see more focus at combat missions tactical level are less relevant. This doesn't mean that BTRs were never meant to fight, but they are meant to fight as one cog in a huge combined arms machine. In a combat mission context, this means that the fight to destroy or suppress enemy tank and ATGM threats should already be well underway by the time BTRs arrive on the battlefield, and although fragile, they should be attacking behind a screen of tanks while massed artillery smashes enemy positions. How well this would work, and how difficult it is to pull off, is one of Combat Mission Cold War's big questions. But that's where the BTR fits in. Hope you all enjoyed this and found it interesting. I'll catch you in the next video.